Hello again. So uh, we move on now to the last part of lecture five, where we are going to focus on um, the behavior of Eve. Um, to this end, basically, we are going to describe some more typical attacks that Eve can perform in order to break, um, anyway, to break the privacy of either Alice and Bob, or in a way to, to fool Alice or, or Bob, right? Um, okay, let's start. So first of all, message replay attack. So this is something that we have already seen uh, quite a lot by now, um, at least in the last videos uh, where we described several flaws. Now achieved by replaying in, in, in last led videos, we, we, we show how Eve can achieve this by replaying all messages and she can violate basically the call of authentication. One example was the denning Sacco attack on Needham Schroeder's protocol, right? Uh, now the freshness of messages must be inferred from some component of the message like a timestamp or a nonce, right? So we need to, at, at the end, when we started redesigning the, 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 the protocol, the Needham Schroeder protocol in order to make it more secure and avoid this replay attack, basically, if you remember, we added some timestamp, right? So the freshness of messages must be inferred from some component of the message, like a timestamp or a nonce. Now, the component must be bound together with the rest of the message, and this means that encryption is not the right primitive to bind, right? Um, so, let's see an example of a message replay attack. Oops. So, let's assume that Bob shares a key with Trent. Trent is a server, as we already know. Uh, Bob has generated a timestamp TB and wants a key KBS to communicate with another server S. So the scenario is that Bob has already um, has been already sharing a symmetric key um, with a server trend with T, has generated a timestamp TB and he wants to communicate securely with another server um, S that he does not share a key with. So his goal is to share a key KBS with that server S and then use that KBS to communicate securely. Good. So let's see how he can do that. So S, then the server constructs an encryption of Bob's timestamp plus one, and this would be encrypted with KBS, right? Now keep in mind that KBS, it's a key that obviously in this scenario has been generated by, by either the server um, S or Trend. Now the thing is, the, the important thing to, to, to note here, to notice is that Bob doesn't have access to KBS, right? So our goal is that somehow Bob will get access to that secret key KBS, right? Good, so the server S, uh, calculates Bob's timestamp plus one and encrypts that with the symmetric key that uh, he intends to share with Bob. And he sends this to Bob. He sends, hello, I'm server S, you are Bob, B, your identity. Um, here is, here are two things. The first one is um, something that you cannot read, but you know that it's basically uh, your timestamp plus one. This is the pre-agreed manner. The, you know, you send the timestamp or announce and the other party uh, replies to you in the pre-agreed manner. Um, and the actual key KBS that I generated for you encrypted with KBT, the key that you are sharing with Trent, right? So upon reception, what would Bob do basically? Uh, upon reception, Bob would use KBT to decrypt that part, find out KBS and then decrypt this part of the message, find out that the timestamp is correct. The correct one is the one that he was expecting, TB plus one, and if everything goes well, then basically he accepts the, that message as valid, so he can start using KBS to communicate securely with the server S, right? So let's say that this is a protocol that someone designed and that's how it works, right? So I, got, I, I hope you got the idea. So the author's reason that having obtained KBS Bob can verify that S has replied to a fresh message so that the session key is indeed fresh. So let's read this again. So the authors of the protocol, they say that, okay, having obtained KBS, the symmetric key that the server S 
which is the share with Bob. Uh, Bob can verify that the server S has replied to a fresh message so that the session key is indeed fresh. Right? So what I would suggest here is that you, you know, you take some time, you stop a bit, you pause the video and you think about it, right? So is it the message that you are receiving fresh? And if, if the message is fresh, does it mean that the secret key KBS that is contained in that message is fresh as well? So this is the main thing that I would like you to think here. So a remark is that sometimes it's the freshness of the operation that is guaranteed, but not the freshness of the key. So here, in that last part of the message that is sent from S to Bob, there is no guarantee that the key that has been generated by S, the key KBS, is fresh. Yes, the message is fresh because uh, the timestamp indicates the freshness of, of the message, but nothing says that that key is a new one. Nothing guarantees to Bob that that particular key has not been used in the past by S again. Okay, so the freshness of the key is somehow different than the freshness of the overall message, right? So this is the main highlight, the main thing that I would like to highlight with, with this example. Good. Uh, let's move on to the parallel session attack. We have already seen um, this um, on, on, on the first video of this lecture. So two or more runs of a protocol are executed at the same time, concurrently. An answer to a difficult question in one run is made available in another run. So what is an answer to a difficult question? It might be an encryption with a key that you don't have access to, like a KAB, or a signature, which means that like, you know, access to a secret key that you don't own and generate a valid signature. So these are kind of difficult answers, uh, of answers to difficult questions. So let's assume we've got Alice and Trent. Uh, so Alice basically contacts Trent, says, hi, I'm Alice, I would like to contact Bob, and here's a nonce NA that I generate. Um, upon reception, what the TTP would do is that, okay, hi, Alice, uh, here is Bob's public key, and here is everything um, signed by me, signed with SK of T. And what, what Everything, when I say everything, I mean Bob's public key, Alice's identity, as well as the nonce that was generated on step one by Alice. Now, Alice asks for Bob's public key PKB and Trend responds in message two. However, nothing ties this response uh, with Bob's ID, and this is problem, right? So here it could be anything, right? So there is no way that Alice can be sure that the public key that she receives here is um, indeed Bob's public key, right? So there is nothing that ties the response with Bob's ID. We have already seen a similar example. So let's see the attack again. So Alice sends uh, to DTP, hi, I'm Alice. I would like to contact Bob. Uh, here is my nuns. But then Eve gets in the middle and she intercepts that message and basically she changes it a bit and says to TDP, hi, I'm Eve, I would like to contact Bob and here's a NANCE NA that I generated for him. Now upon reception, uh, the TDP would say, okay, hi Eve, um, here is uh, Bob's public key. Um, And this would be encrypted with um, Trent's secret key, right? So the, the encryption would, would contain uh, Eve's public key, Alice's identity, and the nonce that was generated in the first place, in first place by Alice. And this would be sent back to Alice through Eve, right? So Eve basically would, would contact Alice and say, hey, um, this is Bob's public key because she's expecting Bob. Uh, to receive Bob's public key, and here's a signature by Trend, same, containing basically the very same nonce that you generated uh, on step one. Um, so Eve initiates a different session with Trend in which uh, he serves as an oracle. Now Trend's answer in the second session um, is used to complete the first session with Alice. Now Alice is convinced that she 
now has Bob's public key, while all she has is Eve's public key. So a fix, obviously, is to include Bob's identity into the message. So if we had Bob's identity here, uh, then this wouldn't work, okay? Because obviously, um, Trent, who is the trusted party, wouldn't put here um, Bob's identity and PK of E. So if you had to put Bob's identity in that signed message, uh, immediately the Eve's public key would have been uh, changed to Bob's public key. Uh, now, another attack that I really like, I mean, it's a very simple idea and I really like how it works. It's, it's the so-called reflection attack. Uh, so it's kind of, um, I have it in my mind like a mirror, you know, you, 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 do you remember with cartoons when you were uh, shooting, for example, um, on the mirror and then the, the, the bullet was just, you know, <laughs> coming back to you. So it's something similar. So when an honest principal sends to an intended communication partner, partner a message for the latter to perform a cryptographic operation, Eve intercepts the message and simply sends it back to the message originator. So basically you intercept the message and you just reflect it back. You send it back to the message originator, right? So let's see the example. So assume we've got a protocol that works as follows. So Alice generates a nonce and name and she sends that nonce to Bob. Upon reception, Bob, um, he uses a secret key that he has been sharing with Alice, KAB, calculates the tag of NA using that specific key. Upon reception, Alice verifies the uh, tag and concludes that Bob is alive. Now, good, so, so the protocol is pretty simple, right? And don't, let's not talk about about the security of the protocol, it's just a very simple example to, to, to give you an idea of how reflection attack works. So the protocol is very simple. Alice can conclude that Bob is alive uh, because um, he's the only one, he and she are the only entities that have access to KAB, right? So since Alice received a valid uh, tag uh, of NA, she can be sure that Bob is alive and he has access to KAB. Good. Now, let's see what Eve can do. So Alice, uh, she sends the nonce NA, right? That is intercepted by, let's say, Eve. Now, this NA was intended to go to, to Bob. Now, Eve, in order to fool Alice, she needs to somehow manage to calculate uh, this MAC, right? Uh, so what she can do, basically, is that she can just get that NA, open a new message, a new connection with Alice, uh, pretending that she's Bob and saying, Hello, Alice, I'm Bob. Here is a nonce NA that I generated for you. Upon reception, what would Alice do, basically, immediately is that she will use KAB, the key that she's sending with Bob, because, you know, there's no way in that stupid protocol to, to check that if um, if send the message and not Bob. So Alice would basically generate, calculate the tag of NA based on the key KAB that she shares with Bob. And immediately, Eve basically gets access, um, gets an answer of a difficult question, which is how to calculate uh, the tag of NA with KAB. And once she gets access to that, basically, she can just continue the first version of the protocol where Alice sends NA to Eve and reply back to Alice by sending a valid um, tag on NA with KAB. And by doing this, uh, Eve can fool basically Alice. And Alice can think that uh, she's talking to Bob while basically she's talking to Eve. Again, I repeat, uh, this is a very uh, simple and kind of stupid protocol, but it just, I think it's a, it's a very good example of, you know, that, that can help you to understand how reflection attack works. So, uh, Eve reflects the challenge NA back to Alice, which she uh, responds with the proper MAC. Then she uses the MAC to complete the run of the first protocol. Now, Alice thinks she's talking to Bob, while in reality, she's talking to Eve. And then we've got the attack due to type of law. Uh, so, in a type of flaw attack, Eve exploits an honest principal's inability 
to associate the methods with its semantic meaning, right? So this is something that, uh, this is the first time that we talk about that, about the semantic meaning of a method. So in a type flow attack, Eve exploits anonymous principles inability to associate the methods with its semantic meaning, right? So till now, I mean, somehow in, under the surface we were assuming that we know more or less the structure of a message which means that what um, each part of the message what it contains right kind of the, the meaning of each part of the message but now we'll, this will become a bit more clear why it's important to be able to associate a message with its meaning so typical attacks involve a principal being tricked to misinterpret the nonce as a key Right, so this might be a big issue. If you manage to fool Alice or Bob um, to use a nonce as a key instead of the actual key, then you might be able to launch some uh, severe attacks. So let's see an example. We've got Alice and Bob. Again, we have a you know an imaginary protocol, uh, and that the protocol works as follows. So Alice contacts Bob saying, "Hi, I'm Alice. We have already shared the key KAB, and." I encrypt the nonce NA with this KAB, right? Upon reception, Bob, who has access to KAB, he decrypts, uh, he finds out NA, and then he replies back to Alice um, in a pre agreed manner, which says for that protocol, increase NA by one and send me another nonce as well. And all of this encrypted with KAB. Okay, so Bob replies back to Alice by sending an encrypted version of NA plus one comma NB. Upon reception, Eve decrypts this, finds out NA plus one, finds the new fresh nonce of Bob, and he replies back by sending an encrypted version of NB plus one. At the end, basically, um, what will Bob do is that he will just send a fresh uh, key, KAB prime, as well as a nonce and be prime a fresh nonce uh, to to initiate to, to to show that the, the the message is fresh. Now that key, obviously KAB prime, will be used as the session key from now on uh, between Alice and Bob. So this is a protocol for um, key re-establishment, right? So Alice and Bob they have already established uh, key KAB. This key, for some reason, it expired, right, after a period of time. And then Alice and Bob, they wish to um, establish a new key, KAB prime. And this is a protocol on how they do it. Now, I suggest that you pause the video here and you look again at the messages, but now look at the structures of the messages, just to see if there are any kind of similarities or possible similarities. So, a hint is that these two messages, message two, and four, um, they have the same structure, right? So they contain, uh, message two contains a nonce and two nonces, while uh, message four contains uh, a nonce and the secret key. This should have been comma here, not plus, but yeah, anyway. Um, so what can we do with this? Uh, let, let, so Alice and Bob basically they end up with a new session key, right? Okay, so what can we do with these two messages if you were Eve? That's the main question. So let me give you a, a hint. So if this, if nonces and keys have the same length, say 128 bits, then Eve can replay the messages in step, in steps two, the message in step two, in step four. So one of the requirements is that if the, non the nonces have the same length as the keys, right? So imagine that this NA plus one has the same length as KAB prime and NB has the same length as NB prime, right? So basically here we have similar messages, right? The same length, everything. Good. Uh, so if nonces and keys have the same length, let's say 128 bits, then Eve can replay the message in step two, in step four. So let's see how the attack works. So Alice contacts Bob saying, hi, I'm Alice. Here is a nonce encrypted with KAB. Bob replies by sending an A plus one along with a new fresh nonce and B. 
Alice replies back by sending NP plus 1 and create with KAB. And then Bob replies back to Alice by sending the fresh key KAB prime plus the fresh nonce NB prime. But then Eve gets in the middle, she intercepts that message, and basically what she will do is that she will change this uh, to the to another message encrypted with KAB. Now that message will be NA plus one comma the nonce NB uh, that was uh, sent earlier. Now upon reception, what poor Alice will do is that she will accept NA plus one as the actual key instead of accepting KAB prime, right? So what Eve did is that she got the second message and she replayed, uh, she, 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 she changed the fourth message with the actual second message, right? And by doing this, Alice was basically fooled and she used NA plus one as the session key, the new session key that would be used by Bob. Now, why this attack, uh, how this attack can, 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 be, can be achieved? Again, we have seen uh, quite a few examples. We have said that uh, Alice had all the time to you know, break that session key at some point. So she has access, for example, to NA. So she can, yeah, shoot to NA plus one. So she, 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 she has access to the fresh key at the end uh, that Alice and Bob generated. So Alice would accept NA prime plus one as the new key. Now some other attacks attack you to name omission. So many experts in their desire to obtain an elegant protocol omit identifiers, which can be reduced by other parts of the protocol. Uh, however, this can be exploited to form an attack. At another attack is due to misuse of cryptographic services. So attack due to absence of integrity protection. We have seen many examples. So sometimes people think that encryption can provide integrity, but this is not true. Right. Um, confidentiality failure due to absence of semantic security protection. This way, partial information can be extracted due to the use of textbook crypto. Good. Um, at the end, some design principles by uh, Abadi and Nitham. So I mentioned in one of the previous videos that they um, published a paper where they proposed some very uh, useful um, and well-structured design principles when we, you know, how, how basically, what kind of rules we should follow when we design secure and privacy-preserving protocols. So here I'll try to highlight the most important um, principles I, I extracted from the paper. So first of all, every message should explain, uh, explicitly say what it means. So the interpretation of the message should be, should depend only on its content. The second one is that if the identity of a principal is essential to the meaning of a message, then it is prudent to include the principal's name explicitly in the message. Uh, remember that um, in one of the first, uh, in the replay attack that we showed in this video, basically, if Trent had included Bob's identity in the signed uh, part of the message, then the attack wouldn't have been possible. Right, so it's important to include principal's name explicitly in the message. Now, three, use the right primitive for the job. Now, encryption should not be used to provide data integrity because it does not. Encryptions, encryption is for secrecy and nothing else, right? So keep this in mind. For all of your security issues, you cannot use cryptography. You cannot use encryption to provide a solution to all of your security related issues, right? Um, some, yeah, uh, for when the principal signs material that has already been encrypted, it should not be inferred that the principal knows the content of the message, right? So this is very important. Uh, so, you know, you sign something, but if what you sign is already encrypted, it doesn't mean that you know exactly what you're signing, right? So you need to take care of that somehow in the protocol. Now, on the other hand, it is proper to infer that the principal who signs a message and then encrypts it for privacy knows the content of the message, right? So these are two different ways of, of signing something, right? And then making some conclusions about uh, the signer. Now, five, a key may have been used recently, for example, to encrypt a nonce, 
but yet be quite old and already compromised. So recent use does not mean the key is fresh. Uh, we, we, we saw an example with, uh, where Bob wanted to, to start communicating with the server S and wanted to, to share uh, through Trend a key KBS, right? So this, the key that was sent at the end by the server S, I mean, it was included in the fresh message, but nothing guaranteed the actual freshness of the key, right? And that was the problem. So always be careful when signing or encrypting data so that you don't be an oracle for anybody. Uh, we have seen some examples uh, where Alice um, was fooled and she, she, she was treated as an oracle by it and she signed uh, or anyway, she, she gave uh, freely uh, an answer to a difficult question to Eve. Right? So that's it. And with that slide, basically, we conclude uh, lecture five. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll talk about uh, TLS protocol and Kerberos, two very well known uh, and widely used um, cryptographic systems. Uh, thanks a lot. See you later.